Hello everyone. My name is Glenn Hall. Today is October 15th, 2019, and today is the second day of the Feast of Tabernacles, the greatest feast in the scripture, the feast that all of us should be looking forward to because the final consummation is going to be so great. Today I'm going to begin uh, part 13 of the Mystery of the Beast. And this video is called A Ransom for the Beast. I was going to do the mark of the beast before this, but I felt the Lord prompting me to do this one instead. It's important because the things that I'm going to be teaching from now on are going to be probably very difficult for many people to accept and even to believe. I'm going to say things that the church doesn't say. I'm going to teach scriptures that will reveal the truths of God that have not been understood until this time in history. A ransom for the beast. Hopefully, you who are watching this have watched my previous videos. If you haven't, you need to go back and watch them because it's very important that you understand certain things. The first video began with the most reviled man in history. Who is that? Second video was, who is the ruler of the world? And why is he the ruler of the world? The third video, The Purpose of the Bible's Parables. The fourth video was, Who is the Beast? You see, these are such important, fundamental concepts that we literally cannot go on until we understand them. The most reviled man in history is Jesus. Jesus the Christ, the Messiah. Who is the ruler of this world? Satan. Satan, even today, is the ruler of this world. And he was affirmed as the ruler of this world by Jesus himself. What's the purpose of the Bible's parables? To hide the truth. Not to reveal it, as most of the church teaches, but to hide it. So that unworthy eyes cannot see it and understand it. And who is the beast? You and me. Mankind is the beast. We have to understand that in order to understand now this, what I'm saying in this video, which is a ransom for the beast. The first scripture I want to draw our attention to is Romans chapter 7, verse 14. That says, The law is spiritual. But I am of the flesh, sold under sin. I have been sold under sin. Who was I sold to? I was sold to the father of sin, to Satan. Remember, Satan tempted Eve to eat of the forbidden fruit. And then God judged her, Eve, Adam, and Satan. And part of Satan's judgment was that he would eat dust. Man was made of the dust. Satan was condemned that throughout history he would eat mankind. Of the first men ever born, Cain and Abel. Cain was upset that God did not accept his sacrifice. God warned him, sin is crouching at the door, and you must defeat it. But he did not defeat it. Instead, he rose up and murdered his brother, and the blood cried out from the ground to condemn him of his murder. Sin was crouching at the door. Sin from Satan. Men were sold to Satan in the very beginning. Now, We 
we often think that Satan messed up God's plan. But of course he didn't. God knew exactly what would happen. In fact, God planned it to happen. Who put the beast, the serpent, in the garden with Adam and Eve? God did. Did did not God know what Satan would say and do and how he would tempt Adam and Eve? Of course he did. Didn't God know what eating of the forbidden fruit would do to Adam and Eve? That it would open their eyes to know both good and evil? Of course he did. And that was the plan. But why? Why the plan? Why did God plan it that way? Because it was part of the creative process of men, of mankind. God did not want to make man into some kind of a robot, some kind of automaton that simply did good because he was programmed to do good. He wanted man to have a moral sense of good and evil and choose the good. Then he would be like God. He would not be like God if he chose the evil. He would only be like God if he chose the good. But he had to know good and evil in order to choose one or the other. We are now living at the consummation of the age, of the consummation of the period of time in which God planned for those who would choose good over evil of their own free will to do so. Those are the people that God calls overcomers in the scripture. The rest are not overcomers, but the rest are not forsaken. And that's what we who understand God's way have to understand, know, and appreciate. Because what is about to happen is the greatest, the the church calls it harvest, but the greatest gathering of of people to faith in God that has ever happened in the history of the world. In order for that to happen, we who serve God have to understand that Jesus Christ was a ransom for all of these people. All of these people that many of us will just consider rejects right now. There are some that we cannot reach. And I'm going to discuss that as we proceed in these videos. But there are many who are now walking away from evil and depravity but who are still holding on to incredible gross sins that we believers need to be able to talk to and reach with the truth because they are responding to truth. They are repenting of the way of life that they've always known to some degree. They are recognizing that there is this incredible evil out there that they can't believe. They were part of it for so long and now they recognize it and they're walking away from it. This idea of a ransom for men is the idea that will grip the hearts of those who are walking away. Isaiah 52.3 says, 
For thus says the Lord, You were sold for nothing, and you shall be redeemed without money. We sinned, Adam sinned, we were sold to Satan, and we will be redeemed without money. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 through 21, part of that says, You were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things like silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ. You see, we're not redeemed with money. We're redeemed with blood. Scripture says the life is in the blood. Now we have to understand the extent of this redemption, this ransom. There's a scripture that all of us need to memorize. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, starting in verse 20. In fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep, who have died. For as by man came death, that's Jesus. Um, So I want to read from uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 20 through 22. In fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. But as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. Pay very careful attention to this. By a man came death. That is the man Adam. By Adam came death. That's verse 21. 1 Corinthians 15, 21. Verse 22 says, As in Adam all die. That's you, that's me, and that's everybody else. Okay, all is all. Every single person that's ever been born is dead. How? We are not dead, or we were not dead physically, of course. The death that Adam died was a spiritual death. God told him, on the day you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will surely die. He did die uh, spiritually not physically. And that, that is, Adam became a, a carnal being at that point, a man of the flesh, a, man, a beast. That's when Adam became a beast, like a beast. Now, as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. Now, did the definition of all change in that one sentence? Of course not. If all died in Adam, the same all will be made alive in Christ. Now, let's go to John. Chapter 14, verse 30. Jesus is speaking to his disciples. This is just before he is captured and crucified. This is the day. This is the night this happened. And in verse 30, he said, I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming. He has no claim on me. The ruler of this world he was talking about was Satan. 
But Jesus said, Satan has no claim on me. Why? Because Jesus was not a man of the flesh. He was not carnal. Jesus never sinned. We're told that in Hebrews chapter 4. Let me just go to that real quickly. Hebrews 4.15 says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Jesus had no sin. So, Jesus had no sin. Satan then had no claim on Jesus. And that's why Jesus could be a ransom for mankind. Let's look at a few verses that talk about a ransom. Leviticus 27, 29 says this, No one devoted who is to be devoted for destruction from mankind shall be ransomed. He shall surely be put to death. Numbers 35, 31 says, Moreover, you shall accept no ransom for the life of a murderer who is guilty of death, but he shall be put to death. Psalm 49, 7 says, Truly, no man can ransom another, or give to God the price of his life. Psalm 49, 8, For the ransom of their life is costly and can never suffice. But later in that same psalm, he says, But God will ransom my soul from the power of Sheol, for he will receive me. Sheol, of course, is the place of the dead. So here... We have the writer of Psalms saying, No man can ransom another, because the ransom of a life is costly. However, by the time he gets to the end of the psalm, he says, God will ransom my soul. And that's what happened. God came in the flesh in Jesus, and God poured out his soul unto death, poured forth his lifeblood and ransomed mankind. When you understand what this ransom is, you see how far-reaching it is. It's just as Paul said in Corinthians, as in Adam all die, so in Christ all shall be made alive. See, the ransom, the ransom touches everyone. And that's what we have to understand. Because when we understand that, then we will become more merciful toward those who don't yet see it, who don't yet understand it. What's the difference between you and me and those who don't yet see it? We understand it. We believe it. We have faith in it. We believe it. That's the only difference between us and the people who don't believe. And now think again to my first video, the most reviled man in all history. Why is it Jesus? Because Satan understands this. And Satan then has done everything he can to lie about Christ, to lie about creation, even so far as the type of world we live on, to lie about everything. As Casey said in 1981, Reagan's CIA director will know we have succeeded when everything the American people believe is a lie. 
just like from the mouth of Satan. Satan has done the same thing. Taught us evolution. Taught us the Big Bang Theory. Teaches us there is no God. Does everything he can to obscure God, to obscure the fact that we had a creator, does everything that he can to make people curse and despise Jesus. Who are the most despised people on earth today? Christians. Who are the most martyred and killed in history? Christians. Because Satan does everything he can to keep people from understanding that Jesus was the ransom for everyone. That way he holds on to his power and his kingdom. What is his domain? It's a domain of darkness. Let's look at a few other scriptures. There's so many here, and I, I want you to write these down. So get a pen and paper, pause this video, and begin to write these down, because I really have a lot of scriptures I want to share. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. In Jesus Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, our sins, according to the riches of his grace. That was Ephesians 1, 7. Now let's go to Colossians. And this is the one that really, the verse that really got me thinking about this a, a couple of months ago. Colossians 1, 12 through 14. I'll start with uh, 11. May you be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might. For all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of, this, of the Kodeshim, of the Holy Ones, in light. That's interpreted saints in our Bible, but I, saints, that word has been ruined. The Kodeshim, or the Holy Ones. So we share in the inheritance of the Holy Ones. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. See, our redemption, it redeemed us from death, it ransomed us from death, and brought the forgiveness of of sins. In the law, and, and it's good to think of this in terms of the law, the land of Israel could not be permanently sold away from a family, away from the, the Israelite family. It could be redeemed. And if it was not redeemed during a particular period of time, it would be absolutely redeemed on the year of Jubilee, which was every 50th year. And so God never allowed the land to permanently leave the nation of Israel. Now Israel, Israel is one of the code words of scripture and it's a code word for the overcomers. So this is a parable. Prophetically, what it's talking about is the land, which is us, can never permanently leave God's jurisdiction or control. Even if it has been sold, and we were sold under sin, we were sold to Satan because of the sin of Adam. But in the prophetic year of Jubilee, that time when God culminates all things, then all of us are going to be restored to our rightful inheritance to a spiritual body 
and totally delivered from any of Satan's lies and dominion. That's what the parable of the redemption of the land is all about. That's why it's so important to understand this concept of parables. The scripture says this in the New Testament, that Jesus never taught without using a parable. That means that everything he spoke, everything he said, everything he did was a parable. Likewise, as God spoke through the prophets in the Old Testament and recorded the history, the actual literal history of his people, it was written in such a way that it was also a parable. Even though historically true, it spoke prophetic truth. That's why it's, uh, it's so important to understand this whole idea of parables. Okay, let's go to another scripture, another good one in uh, Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. And you who were dead in your trespasses, your sins, and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, with Christ, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. Now let's go to 1 Peter. This is a very interesting scripture. 1 Peter chapter 1. Verses 18 through 21. Starting with 17. And if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile. We are sojourners in the earth. We are exiled from the kingdom of God. We don't live in God's kingdom. We live in this hostile environment of the earth in which we have always been persecuted. All of God's overcomers, all of the Kodeshim, all of the holy people have always been persecuted. Verse 18, knowing that you were ransomed, there's that word again, ransomed, redeemed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world. In other words, before our creation, Christ was foreknown. The work of Jesus was foreknown and planned. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for your sake, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Now let's go to Galatians. All of the scripture works together to tell the very same story. All of scripture tells the same story. Now we're going to go to Galatians chapter 1. We'll read verses 3 and 4. It says, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. So we live in an evil age. The age has been evil since the fall of Adam. Christ died to deliver us from the domain of darkness and bring us into the kingdom of light. Let's go now to Galatians 3 verse 13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Christ 
Christ became a curse for us. So it's, it's no surprise that people curse using the name of Jesus. Isn't that even a proof of he is who the Bible says he is? Who else is used as a curse? No one. And then Galatians 4 verse 5. Four and five. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons or might receive the placement as sons. Okay, we were all under the law. You are either going to be under the law or you are going to be under grace. But the first verse we read today was Romans 7, verse 14, that says, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold under sin. The law itself is spiritual. The application of the law under the past, in the past and with Israel was in the natural and they tried to apply it in the natural and not spiritually. Now I'm going to take us to a few verses that further expound upon this. This is uh, the Song of Moses in Exodus chapter 15. I'm going to start at verse 10. Or verse 11. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders? You stretched out your right hand, the earth swallowed them. Talking about the army of Egypt being swallowed in the Red Sea. You have led in your steadfast love the people whom you have redeemed. You have guided them by your strength to your holy abode. The peoples have heard, they tremble. Pangs have seized the inhabitants of Philistia. Now are the chiefs of Edom dismayed. Trembling seizes the leaders of Moab. All the inhabitants of Canaan have melted away. Terror and dread fall upon them because of the greatness of your arm. They are still as stone. Till your people, O Lord, pass by. Till the people pass by whom you have purchased. He purchased them. Israel, and he purchases us with his blood. But what about these people? Philistia, Edom, Moab, Canaan. These are people that in the scripture end up representing what is spiritually called the great city or Babylon the Great. Just wanted to quickly make note of that. We're going to come back to that a lot in later videos. Then verse 17, you will bring them in and plant them on your own mountain. Remember, a mountain is a government. And the mountain of the Lord becomes the chief mountain in the earth. Soon. The place, O Lord, which you have made for your abode, the sanctuary, O Lord, which you, your hands have established. The Lord will reign forever and ever. Okay, this is the Song of Moses. Now we're going to go to Revelation chapter 5. Then I saw 
In the right hand of him who was seated on the throne, a scroll written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and break the seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. Heaven, earth, under the earth. Those are the three realms of beings that are affected by what is going to happen next. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, Weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered. He is the root of David. So that, no one, so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And between the throne and the four living creatures, or the four living beasts, and among the elders I saw a lamb standing, as though it had been slain, with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Well, who is this? Of course, it's Jesus. He was the lamb who was slain. But look what he looks like. Seven horns, seven eyes. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Fell down and worshipped the lamb. Only God can be worshipped. Each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. These are the prayers of the saints that were never answered, haven't been answered yet. How many overcomers, how many Kodeshim have been martyred and slain and put in great fear of their lives and who prayed for deliverance and were not delivered? These are their prayers. The time is coming when they will know a great deliverance. And they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God and they shall reign on the earth. And then we go to Revelation 14 that says, Then I looked, and behold, on Mount Zion stood the Lamb, and with him 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven like the roar of many waters and like the sound of loud thunder. The voice I heard was like the sound of harpists playing on their harps, and they were singing a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and before the elders. No one could learn that song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from earth. It is these who have not defiled themselves with women, for they are virgins. It is these who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. These have been redeemed from mankind as first fruits for God and the Lamb, and in their mouth no lie was found, for they are blameless. This is the overcomers. They were redeemed from mankind as first fruits for God. There is an order in which the people of the earth are harvested, are resurrected from the dead. The overcomers are the ones who lost their lives in order to serve the one true God. They're the ones who gave up their souls unto death. They are the ones who separated themselves from the ways of the world, 
We are told, love not the world or the things of the world. These are the ones who obeyed that command. They're the first fruits. They are going to be the first who receive the glorified body. They are the overcomers. They also were part of the beast because they were born of Adam, just like you and just like me. We have all been part of the beast and we have all been redeemed. The difference between people is that some know it and some don't. And then the difference between those who know it is that some act upon what they know. They obey the gospel. They obey Christ. They walk in God's ways. They are not under law. They are under grace. But it doesn't mean that they disobey the law. It doesn't mean that they are lawless. It doesn't mean that they indulge in all of the things that Satan wants to get our flesh to indulge in. They are the ones who have turned away from all of the lusts of the flesh, who want to live a life that is holy and righteous before God. We have to understand that all of us are or have been part of the beast. Next, we're going to look at what the mark of the beast is. And, and how to deal with that. We're moving forward with understanding the mystery of the beast. I haven't yet shared the hardest thing to share, but we're getting closer to that. And we have to be prepared with these foundational truths because the time is coming when we have got to be able to deal with and help those who are still part of the beast. And we have to have compassion for the beast. We have to have compassion and love for those who are still part of the beast.